edition of Critical Mass Radio Show and Podcast. I'm your host, Richard Franzi, and this is a really, really special episode. One, because we have an outstanding author who's written a fantastic book, and two, this is our episode number 1,100. That is a milestone, and can't think of it. That's a good round number to have me on for, right? This is podcast number 1,100, and we have Chris Dyer. You just heard his voice. You know, culture is the foundation for success in any organization, so it's not a surprise that companies with the strongest positive cultures hold top slots on leaderboards of several lists, including best places to work. That's why I've asked Chris Dyer to show up here today to talk about his latest book, And for those of you that are watching us live on Facebook, here it is. It is The Power of Company Culture, How Any Business Can Build a Culture That Improves Productivity, Performance, and Profits. The three Ps, I guess. Chris, welcome to Critical Mass Radio Show. Thanks so much for having me back again. Well, that's awesome. Let's talk about um, the significance of of a company's culture. So in writing this book, Mm -hmm. heavily researched, a lot of facts, a lot of details. Tell me, you know, what is from your viewpoint as the author of this book, the significance of culture in a company? Yeah, so I really started to ask a lot of questions about companies and about what great cultures were doing and great leaders were doing. And this really came out of my own story of struggling in 2008, 2009, when we had the recession and really had a lot of time in my hands in my business to start thinking about these things, (laughs) right? As people aren't ordering as much and you're wondering where you're going to pay the bills. So I started, you know, really asking a lot of questions and having these great conversations with people. And that really led me to some truths, right? And sort of discovering that some of the things we weren't doing well wasn't because we weren't good at them. It wasn't because we didn't have the right people. It was just we hadn't thought about it. We hadn't put our attention in these places mm. and noticed that other people were. And so a lot of that's sort of the foundation where we started with the book that, you know, uh, my discovery that culture really is that missing thing between companies who are doing okay right. and companies who are really, really doing well. Okay. And um, in your book, you talk about the importance of a value statement, the importance of a mission statement, mm-hmm. the, the, report, the importance of a vision statement, and then customers, customer service focus. So c- can you expand a little bit on that? Sure. So the book is really broken up into three pieces. Is what, are you, what are you supposed to be doing today to at least be good? Right. <laughs> I, I, I wanted to help people understand the difference between what was good and great. OK. OK. So take a little from Jim Collins there. Right. Right. So but what do you do today to be at least be good? And so if you don't have a value statement, if you don't have a customer service focus, if you don't if you have all of these things, you are behind the curve today. OK. Right. And so you might need to go back and do your homework there. And that was the, the beginnings of the book. We talk about Simon Sinek, you know, starting with why. We talk about uh, Daniel Pink's work, uh, Mastery, Autonomy, Purpose. Right. Right. So if you're not doing those things, you really can't move on to section two of my book to try to be great because you got to at least, it's like saying I want to go from sitting on the couch watching TV all day to running a marathon tomorrow. Okay. You have some work, right, between right. that, between point A and point B. And that was the in, intent here that, for people to go back, because I have asked business leaders, you know, what's your value statement? What's your mission statement? Uh, 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 you know, and they don't know, and their employees don't know. Or, right. Well, I guess we did that 25 years ago when we started the company, right? right. So that was this idea that you need to have these things thought out um, as at least your starting point mm-hmm. to begin that conversation internally about where you want to take your culture. So um, you must consider then value statement, mission statement, vision statement, and customer service focus as just table stakes. If, right, y- y- right, right. Y- you got to show up with that. Right, right. <laughs> and, and so, if you want to start somewhere, CEOs of companies to become what this book talks about and create your culture, start there. Start there. Right. Start with the simple stuff. Right. And then, and and see, because that's and that's also um, so part of culture. It's a little confusing because it really needs a leader or leaders to 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 guide the ship, right? But okay. at the same time, you need people to be helping you with where you need to go. So it's almost like you're asking your everyone on the boat, where should we go? And they're saying, well, maybe we should go somewhere tropical. And then the, the captain needs to say, great, we'll go to Hawaii, right? right. So you kind of have to have this give and take, you know, it's not all top down, it's not all, you know, bottom up, mm-hmm. but it's a combination. And so these statements are the beginnings of a leader to start articulating to the organization 
this is at least where we are at. This is where I see the company. Right. And then you're either in or you're out right. as an employee. You either agree with this stuff. This either resonates or it doesn't. And then let's go talk about all the squishy rest of the culture stuff and right. figure that out. Would you agree, Chris Dyer, author of The Power of Company Culture, that whether the leader is intentional about the culture of their company or not, their company has a culture? Oh, yeah. You, you have a culture, and it's either what you want or it's not what you want. Right. right. So there is always a culture. Um, and I know people that ignore it, and then the culture is a subculture of which is sort of bad, right, or distracting, or what have you. Or you could even look at other organizations, big organizations. We could use Uber or some of these other ones where their culture is not intentional enough, where they have divisions that are sort of kind of messing up the rest of the company, right? right. Because they're, they've become so powerful or so uh, obtrusive to what's happening in the organization. Right. And um, it is my sense that and tell me your view on this, that even in middle market companies, the CEO business owner may be the single person who understands their company culture, if they're not intentional about it, mm -hmm. the least. Because whenever they're in the presence of their employees, their employees are slightly different. They behave slightly differently Absolutely. when the boss is in the room, right? Right, right. And that's what culture is, is what is it that is happening inside the company when people don't have someone telling them what to do? What, how do they make decisions? How do they operate? How do they go about their job right. when someone's not standing over the top of them or the boss is not, you know, in a meeting with them? That's their culture. Right. And, you know, it's sort of like, uh, you know, you, you talk about ethics, right? Was it, I think it, you, know, was it, yeah, you know, what do you do when no one's looking? Right? right. It's the same idea. How do employees act? How do they behave when there's not that force on them? Right. That's culture. Uh, and I... Tell me how you feel about this. I believe that middle market, the people that listen to my radio show, middle market companies across mm -hmm. the country have an advantage potentially of creating a better culture than their larger competitors because scale makes culture sometimes difficult to reinforce. Yeah. yeah, so there's two parts to there. One, they have, it's easier for them to quickly get a lot better, to quickly move and to change and do all of that. What the, the other thing they have going against them is a lot of the big companies are doing it really well. Okay. And so there are some great examples of that. Right. And you write about a number of them in the book. Yeah. Right? And so you also have them, you know, if they're that far ahead of you and you're not at least doing something. Right. I mean, you're going to get, you're going to get just absolutely squished. Not to mention if you, if you're, if you're sort of idea here is to ever get purchased. If you ever <laughs> want to sell your company one day, you want to yeah. retire. Yeah. If you don't have a good culture. Other great culture companies aren't going to come in and buy you. If they have a good culture or a great culture, and they're going to walk in and you're, you know, people running around the, you know, <laughs> it, it's just not angry. a good thing. Angry or they're or messed up. Or they don't have a good way they work. That is the number one reason that uh, mergers and acquisitions don't work is people and wow. culture. And so if that if you don't have something going there, then you're right. unattractive to buyers. Right. And and I'm going to take a slight exception with what, although you write about some really good companies, large companies, I find them to be the exception to the rule. When you look at something like a Gallup employee survey, mm -hmm. and there's 80% of the workforce that's either not engaged or actively disengaged, right. it's a small percentage of the population that is engaged in workforce, and I think that's directly related to the culture. Right, absolutely. So yeah, to say that um, big companies are doing it well in general would not be the case. Okay. There, are, there are certainly gl gleaming examples of good, col great culture from some big companies, but right. You're right. Most employees are not engaged, um, and that's for a lot of reasons. Right. Um, and most there's a there's such an incredible amount of like uh, improvement we can do. Right. So we're starting off so bad right now. <laughs> in, in, right. Like, as a companies in general in the United yeah. States of America, we are pretty bad. Right. And so that's a, an awesome statement that we could do so much to get so much. better. We're not trying to get from B plus to A minus. Yeah. We're going from D minus right now <laughs> as as a as a country, as a general over organizations in general to this. Right. Can we get to a B? Right. right? And I, and I, I want to continue this thought. But Paul's telling me it's time to take our short break here because. I believe an engaged workforce touches your customers. They notice it because of what you just said, because it doesn't happen that often. Right. And when they're treated well, they're almost like, i got to tell somebody about this because I'm not used to that behavior. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Love to talk about it more. All right. And I want to talk about your seven pillars of culture.
We got lots to talk about. In ten we, minutes. We just oh, in ten minutes. <laughs> we can just keep this going for hours. It's <laughs> okay, fine. ladies and gentlemen. You don't want to go anywhere because I'm talking to Chris Thayer. He's the author of The Power of Company Culture. We'll be right back after this word from me. Radio show and podcast. It's a special show for two reasons. One, we have an outstanding guest, Chris Thayer, author of The Power of Company Culture, and two, it is our eleven hundredth podcast radio show interview. One thousand one hundred. Nice round number. You know. Oh, well, there you go. That's the gong. So all of our shows are available on iHeartRadio, iTunes, Stitcher. You know the drill. So if you want to listen to them, hundreds of thousands of people have listened to our show over the time we've been doing the show. But I want to get back. I'm abbreviating this because we've got a lot to get in touch with. So le- let's talk about the seven pillars of, cu- of culture success. Um, you've researched this, and you've been able to put it into kind of – I don't know that we can talk about all seven in ten minutes – so so let's can we talk about what they are and then sure. figure out which ones are the most appropriate? Sure. So this really came from as you rem- might remember, I was a guest on your show and I'd already begun this process of of learning and and reading and doing all this research, but then I started my own radio show as a as sort of a uh, a result of being on yours and I started having some really cool people on the show. And w- so one if you've ever taken the, the Gallup Strength Finders, my number one strength is ideation. Okay. And so people who have ideation are able to get look at a thousand ideas and then say that one and that one are a really good idea and that's what we should do. So that's a strength of mine. To, All right. to, I can get take lots of information and distill the what's important. And so as I was having some of these great guests on, I started hearing the same things. Some of the same things over and over again. If it was a great culture, if it was a great company, whether they were a small company, mid-cap, whether they were a giant company, I was hearing these seven things over and over and over again. They had slightly different vocabulary. Sometimes they were articulated a different way. Right. But this is the same seven things over and over. And that's what really got me onto this seven. And then I went back and did the research to validate that that was true. And then went back and more research to validate that these seven things really, you know, really were kind of concrete things that people can hang their hat on to try to be a great culture. Right. So we have everything from, let's see if I can remember all the top, seven off the top of my head. Um, we have transparency. Yes. We have uh, uh, mistakes is yes. the second one. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Positivity, measurement, um, uniqueness, and listening. And so companies that have these things really th- not only thought about, and articulated, but are constantly working at them. Okay. Right? So if you take measurement, let's take that one. All right. Um, Google is famous for being incredible measurers. They measure what they measure. Okay. Laszlo Block talks about this in his great book, Work Rules. He was the vice president of HR for a lot of years there. And he talks about how they measured what made a great team. They measured, um, you know, how their travel expenses would change over time. All these different things so they could get more efficient, so they could get more profitable, so they could be better for their customer. Mm. And I, when I read that, I thought about, well, geez, how many things do I measure in my company? It was like all on one hand, right? And I didn't even finish all the fingers <laughs> that was And measuring. he has a full hand of fingers. Right, I have a full <laughs> hand of fingers, and yeah. I didn't even get all five down. So... <laughs> I wasn't measuring very much at all. I mean, you measure your sales. Yeah, right. Right? Yeah. That's important. You might measure your costs. Yeah. You know, some, you know, you look at P&L way. and things like that. But then it was like, what else do we measure? We do measure our hours for employees. We measure time, you know, vacation days. I mean, all these things we could be measuring and talking about and doing, you know, customer satisfaction surveys and employee surveys and all these things to help you get a better sense. Because often what happens is people are completely screwed up and their perceptions are totally wrong. You ask everyone what's wrong with our company or what's right with our company or what should we change or do. It's all based on something they read yesterday in the newspaper or something their mom said or whatever. It's just whatever random thing is bouncing around in their brains today. Uh And that's not necessarily where we need to put our energy. We need to look at data and and use that as part of the overarching story for us to make good decisions about where we should spend our time and our energy to make our companies better. Okay. The other one that that I found on the surface didn't seem to fit, but I'd like you to explain it as you do in the book, mistakes. Yeah. So again, I found that the best companies knew how to deal with mistakes inside of their companies. And so the best example, I've had Southwest Airlines, a head of people, uh, a couple of their, uh, in that department, a couple of their people on, and they talk about how if employee um, believes they're doing the right thing for the customer, they will back that employee up absolutely to the ends of the earth. Now, they may retrain them, 
the employee might have been wrong and they okay. may retrain them and they may help them, but they are not going to fire them and they're not going to publicly come out and say oh, that employee was wrong and you know they shouldn't have done that or whatever. They support that employee. Wow. And so that employee may have made a mistake. So I really um, distinguish in the book the difference between mistakes and errors. If you have a payroll clerk who keeps calculating payroll wrong, that's an <laughs> error. That's a lack of knowing how to use a calculator or a spreadsheet or whatever. Yeah, and if you can't retrain that person, it's time for them to go. Right. That is not what we're talking about. We're talking about big companies like 3M and Southwest and Google who look, who try new things, try big things to make things better. And when they fail, which we fail more times than not, right. they go back and they talk about it. They're open about it. They share with their colleagues and they figure out why they failed. So the next time, maybe they cannot fail the next time. And so there's this openness inside of their culture mm. and it really ties into innovation. If you have an innovative company, failing is on the menu every day. Right. And that is okay and is what we expect. On the flip side, you're inside of a traditional company where mistakes are not a right. part of it, right? right? You hide from them. People don't want to admit them. Yes. The boss especially is hiding from them. Right. And you try um, to point it out a different. It's not my fault because. Because there's a reason. There's someone right. else's fault. Up the line, fault. down the, the line. The economy's bad. You're you know, right. there's a lot of people who make a lot of money when, there, when there's a recession. You know, there's a lot of people who still do very, very well in this in, in our in our world no matter what the variables are. Right. Uh, I mean, Apple has continued to grow and grow and grow despite whatever happens in the economy, right? Yes. People have no jobs and they show up to buy their products. So there there aren't those excuses. You have to find those iterations one at a time on how to get there. Uh, and that's why I think mistakes are so important inside of companies. Okay, so I can see how mistakes tie to posit having a positivity, positive mm -hmm. yeah. and, and transparency. Uh, and then um, tell me a little bit about listening. And yeah. Listen. So I also noticed that the best companies, and this is a two part thing again, not only listen, but they know how to make sure that they were heard. Mm. So it's this combination of, of, of listening, right? So, so they listen to their clients, they listen to their employees, that's important. And then their employees and everyone else it may, it has this ability to know that they are heard by making sure that we have communicated in a two way you know, exchange. Um, by repeating, by using these things called like, like three plus, right? So if it's important for me to make sure you understand that if you buy this product, this thing is going to happen, right? Okay. I may repeat that three times in three different ways in our conversation. That's a, that's a very uh, specific technique. And so by doing that, you have affirmed in three over three times that yes, you understand. Yes. I buy this mortgage, it's going to be at 6% for 30 years. And, and, you know, and, and that's important that you understand what you're buying, right? Yes. And so you would might repeat that multiple times so that there isn't buyer's remorse. There isn't this somebody took advantage of me, right? There's these different strategies. So um, it's super important for companies to do that. And again, it, it does tie back into innovation again, that if you're not open to listening to the market and to your customers about what they are seeing and what they're hearing and what they're saying they want, you're going to keep shoving the same solution down their throat because that's what's profitable today. Right. And then all of a sudden you're out of business when somebody else comes in and disrupts you, right? Uh, I, I love this listen because I've seen far too often leaders either shut down the feedback that's counter to them, they give body signals, mm -hmm. or the folklore is if you tell them something they don't like, you're going to get there's repercussions for that. Right. Right. Or they never really fully are curious about why you're telling me this it's their job to change your mind so they immediately go into either selling mode or they become defensive and right. and and want to advocate for their position rather than listening to learn and understand right now some of the third part of the book really gets into how do you make this happen okay and so this is really important because we talk about a lot about cognitive biases and one of my favorite ones which is getting into what you just mentioned is timing about when you do these things because uh, and you can read the book and hear all the stories, but you know, if people are hungry, their default is no. And so if you ask someone to do something, <laughs> if you walk into your boss right before lunch and say, I want to raise, I want to do something, guess what? The answer is going to be no 99% of the time Okay. because they're hungry and they're grumpy and their brain is focused on, I need food. So it's get out of my way. No, talk to me later. Bye-bye. Right. I need to go get food. Now wow. show up into your boss's office right after lunch and they're properly fed and hungry and happy. Guess what? You're far more likely to get a better answer. You may not I'm not guaranteeing you a yes. you got right. to come with a good idea. Right. But at least they're going to be open to the idea. Um, same thing happens when you are working with your teams. 
if it's a cold room, if they're hungry, if they are in a situation where they're fearful or whatever, if they're not fearful. open right. to this conversation, you say, geez, guys, I want us to talk today about how do we become more transparent in a freezing room where they're, where they're starving. You know, it's 1130 and they haven't eaten yet. They're going to be like, I don't know what you're talking about. How do, can we just get through this meeting and I'm out of here? Right. right. They're not engaged at all. And that is not because you're a bad leader. It's not because it's a, ba a bad idea. It's because they're just not physically ready. Their brains are turned off to mm. anything that's happening. So it's super important that we're aware about how we approach, when we approach, and where we approach people if we want to get uh, any sort of you know good alternatives. And, you know, really good salespeople, whether they know this consciously or subconsciously, they have figured this out, right? Why, why are there so many business deals done over, you know, a lunch right. or a dinner or whatever, or some sort of a, with alcohol or whatever uh, their, read my mind. Right, right. whatever yeah. their thing social is, right? The right. Social like, things that happen and they've already gotten people o to be opened up. Right. And so you have to do the same things at work and finding the right ways to do this. And this is, there's no coincidence why so many companies pay for food they have food everywhere mm. at, their, at their companies their employees are always fed and i don't know if anybody knew this when they started this craze right. or if it was just an accidental afterthought that right. we're feeding our people all the time and they're open most innovative companies have food around all day long. you walk right. a cornerstone demand when i'm there there's a granola bar every five feet where you walk i mean it is amazing <laughs> and they have a cafeteria there it's all free for their people wow. you know, google's that way i mean yeah. a lot of these great places so it's it's interesting so who's this book for the power of company culture who'd you write it for you know i, I wrote it for really two groups and i think it's the your average person like i think who your market is that business owner that ceo that's in in a company where they're at a pivot point where they're ready to to get bigger, right? Yeah. They're ready to explode. Right. Um, and the flip side of that is too, is that, average, that CHRO, that head of HR who's dealing with this stuff, who's maybe all sick and tired all day long of reacting to problems instead of getting ahead of it by being proactive, by focusing on some of these better areas and maybe eliminating all that line out their door to, uh, of you know, problems they have to fix today. Right. Um, so I think those are the two biggest groups are really for, but any manager, any person who has to do work and deal with another person in their life, I think can find value in it. I know that's a little self um, fulfilling prophecy there for anybody. It's valuable to me, but I, I really believe that anyone who, who reads that, because I'm pulling in lessons from the best of the best. And I'm providing you, uh, as you mentioned, a lot of case studies and a lot of scientific uh, evidence in a way that's digestible. Right. And then if you find it interesting, then at, at the end of the chapter is the study and you can go read it like I did and get all of the nuggets. So. so if someone wants to buy the book? They should go to Amazon. They can find it there, The Power of Company Culture. They can go to my publisher, Kogan Page, and, and buy it there. So Kogan Page, they're a big uh, business book um, I want you to spell publisher. it. Yeah, oh, who? who? I would say why. Well, yeah. Kogan is K-O-G-A-N, and then Page, P-A-G-E. They've been a good publisher for been you. Been a great publisher. We've been a really big supportive uh, group for them, and they do a lot of, uh, for us, and they do a lot uh, for the books, and um, it's been great to work with them. This is an uh, awesome book. Well done. Congratulations. Thank you. I know you're on a book tour. I'm, I appreciate the fact that you've spent a little bit of time here on Critical Mass Radio Show talking to our audience yeah. about it. I'm just going to keep following you around and copying you, and I'll do, I'll <laughs> this do just fine. Awesome. You're just, <laughs> this is awesome. I'm very, I'm very happy for you. And seriously, ladies and gentlemen, culture leads to engagement, leads to a differentiated company, leads to more value. Absolutely. Right? The, pr the numbers speak for themselves. Yeah, you can't go wrong. I mean, I have no one yet has tried to make their culture better and come back and say, well, I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> I don't no. Happy people at work? Yeah. <laughs> oh, no way. All right. So I'd like to thank Paul Roberts, engineer today, for all the shows we did. Also, our producers, without whom we wouldn't have a show, Joan Park, Crystal Nunley, and Haley Stern. I'd ask for you to connect with me on LinkedIn. If we're not already connected, I'm Richard Franzi, F-R-A-N-Z-I. We'll start the conversation on LinkedIn. We'll see where it goes from there. And if you're looking for another book in addition to Chris's book, The Power of Company Culture, consider Killing Cats Leads to Rats, Mitigating the Unintended Consequences of Business Decisions. It, too, is available on Amazon.com, Barnes & Noble, and um, other booksellers in both Kindle, audiobook, and paperback. So until our next show, I hope all of your business decisions will move your company in a positive direction.